Greetings, it is I, Tantus Naravan Jacobin, Lord and Emperor of the Jacobin Empire, and welcome. It is time to continue my discussion on the various campaign settings of Dungeon Dragons, many of which date back to Advanced Dungeon Dragons. And of course, where we started, Spelljammer! Dungeon and Dragons Adventures in Space. Let's continue talking about the basics of combat and tactical movement. That's where we're on today. So, facing. Now that we've placed our characters, or our ships I should say, on our hex grids, they're going to face a certain direction. This will be represented by them having a marker or something on their figure which will tell you this is the direction they are facing, this side of their hex, which of the six directions I am facing. This is the direction I can move with my ship. That's one of the important factors of it. It will tell me which direction my ship is moving. Any weapons that I have on board the ship, it will tell me what direction they can fire, if they have certain arcs. Now, on my turn, I can change my facing. This is going to be part of my movement. When I am moving, I can also change my facing, turn myself around to face somewhere else. You might put larger objects or larger ships on the board. They will also need to consider facing for themselves. Traditionally, though, facing is less important for, let's say, an asteroid, but a facing might tell me which direction its docks are, which direction something else is in response to it. It will give me an alignment of where this entire map of it that's a sub-map almost, you could say, is aboard on my hex grid. The same for larger ships. Larger ships, when we determine a edge for facing, it's every one of the hexes it takes up is that edge. That's the same thing for those asteroids, which might not be moving, or those planetoids, which might show up on your map. The facing is the same for all of its hexes, regardless if you're in the middle of it or on the side. Now, a ship's movement is determined by its SR, its spell jamming rating. It will cost you one SR to move one hex forward or to change one face. So if I would have three XR, has SR, I could change a face, move forward, change a face. Theoretically, we'll talk about how often and how many times during the course of your actions you can change your faces. That'll be an important thing to talk about. But just consider that I could maybe change my face once, move forward two. That's a little bit of a simpler one. Regardless, at the end of your movement, you always get one free change of face that you may or may not take. That means I make my movement straight forward in a line. I can still make one change of face at the end of that movement. That will not cost me any SR. I can just do extra. And this is beyond any other changes of face I would have made during the course of my move. That means if I had the ability to, I had an SR of three, I could change three faces and then get a fourth one in. Again, I'll talk about if you have that ability. Now, it's a very important thing to note that the maneuverability class of your vessel will determine how often you can change your face and what happens when you change your face. So there's a lot of details to degree to it. I'm not gonna dive into the depths of this. If you wanna check your maneuverability class against information in the book, go ahead and see how it's affecting your facing, your turning, your movement, because maneuverability class next to your SR is going to be critical to determining how your ship moves through space. But let's talk about your actual ship's speed, its movement to agree. The fact is the number of spaces you move hex as you move, and the number of faces you change added together is the speed of your ship. That's when we're talking about speed. This isn't your movement, this is your speed. And when you have something like a helm or other kind of magical propulsion, your speed will have a maximum equivalent to your SR rating. So this won't be for everything. There will be vessels that will have a speed less than their SR rating if they aren't using a helm or a mystical type of transportation to it. They have them out there. This will be affected directly by this. Now on your turn, you effectively would choosing the speed you want to travel. The fact is though, you don't always just choose the speed directly. If I chose a speed of five last turn, depending on my maneuverability class and my helm will depend on how much I can change that speed in between turns. There's the big thing. Effectively, the greater maneuverability class you have, the better helm you have, can alter this. 
A major helm can determine its speed, which is up to its SR, every turn flat. That means I could choose to, if I had, an, let's say, an SR of 6, I could choose to move 6 squares on one turn. The next turn, I can move 0. I could move some other kind of amount. But if I did not have a major helm and I had to look to my maneuverability class, I, after that 6, might only be able to drop back my speed by 1. Or if my maximum is 7, increase my speed by 1. You can see that's the difference here, is my acceleration and deceleration are altered by the fact that if I have a major helm, whatever it is, then that's whatever. If I don't, then I'm limited. Let's talk about that limitations though. If my maneuverability class is F, my acceleration or deceleration is only one each turn. That means between each turn, I can put up my speed by one, decrease it by one, maneuverability class of E and D, two, and C or higher is three then. So though I could have a maneuver with the class A, if I only have a minor helm in my vessel, well, I'm only increasing or decreasing my speed by three every turn, so I am still limited. And remember, when we talk about speed, we're talking about the combination of the hexes you move and the facing you do, both of those together. And then we still have to look to your maneuverability class to see how your facing is limited. Big limitations here. Now, all vessels can, of course, go in reverse. Sometimes you need to back out of something. This is limited once again by the changes in acceleration or deceleration. For something like a major helm, I could switch on a dime. I could switch to reverse. Other vessels, especially something, let's say, with an F, I would have to decelerate down to zero for a turn, and then I could start going in reverse. The maximum amount of speed you can always go in reverse is two, period. You can only reverse two hexes at a time. Now, with all this movement around the board, ships, well, they can enter each other's spaces. There's actually no limitation to the number of ships that can be on the same space on the board. It's an interesting little fact there. The fact is, it's when these ships are all in the same space is when a level of combat occurs. This is when you might have ramming, when you have, might have boarding, when you might have close combat spells. Maybe even when you want to grapple another ship and drag it along with you. All these opportunities occur once you enter into the same hex. Now, combat takes two forms. Long range and close range. Long range is just that. It's when two ships are in different hexes. At this point in time, most spells aren't going to work. Most of the time, what you're going to use to fight each other is missiles or other heavy weapons. That's what you're going to be firing at each other. The other type of combat is close combat, when two ships are occupying the same hex. This is when you can still have your missile combat, your heavy weapon combat, but now you can employ a lot more spells. This is when you might get ramming and boarding and all those other things that happen once you're in close combat to each other. Now, you will be taking, of course, your turns. All ships will have an initiative, just like all the players. The initiative in ship-based combat works a little differently. Effectively, you will start by determining what's all in the combat, determine the general activities that each of these groups will be doing, roll the initiative, put it in order, then go through the order. Now, here's where important details take place. In the course of the initiative, we go down the list and each ship moves individually. That seems simple enough, but when we start talking about the combat of ships, here's where it gets complex. On my ship, I get to move my movement, whatever it is, my speed, whatever's appropriate, and at the end of my turn, I can choose to make an attack. I have to be stopped moving to make an attack with my ship. It is important also to note that though, when I'm not moving, I can engage in combat. This could be long-range combat. This could be short-range combat. So to a degree, both long and short-range combat can occur at any time. So I've ended my movement. I make a choice at the time that I've ended my movement whether I'm going to fire my weapons, my long-range weapons, or not. Or even my short-range weapons if I'm within short-range combat. This is when both the siege weapons would be fired or the characters that are on board would fire their weapons, either this is NPCs or PCs. After I make that choice, every other ship engaged in this combat can make a choice to either attack 
I, the ship that just moved, or another ship using their attack. And it will go down that list in initiative order. Once this option of combat is completed, then we move on to the next ship's movement. And we repeat this process. Here's some of the big caveats. Weapons can only be fired from a ship once a turn. There you go. That means that I can react to that ship's movement, or that ship's movement, or that ship's movement, or my own movement, and fire my weapons. I have those options going down from the person who's moving and then initiative order. So if I acted first, yes, at the end of my turn, I get to choose yes or no to using my weapons. But after that, after each of their movements and they decide whether or not they're going to use their weapons, I get the first choice of using my weapons. It is also very important to note that siege weapons often take many rounds to reload. So the fact is that though I might be able to fire it right then and there, it might be a little while before I can fire my siege weapons again. I might just have to rely on the missile weapons, or maybe if I get into close combat, that sort of combat weapons at that point. This is the beauty and the complexity of ship-based combat. But that's it for today. So I talked to you about facing and its importance. I talked to you about the ship's movement and its speed and how it relates to facing, because there's some complexities there that we have to talk, we talked about. You should understand. And then I've dived now into combat. And of course, talking about your just basic turn order and how it works. We're going to talk about initiative and then move into specifically more things based on long range combat before going into close combat in the next couple of episodes. Combat is going to be a big one we're going to be talking about for a while when it comes to ships because there's a lot of material in it that differs from average Dungeons & Dragons combat, whether AD&D or 5th edition both of them, a lot of these rules still apply. So I will mention where things are specifically more AD&D centric, okay? But I hope you're having a great day. And until the next time, I bid you farewell.